Malware Mondays episode 4 is here, and in this episode we'll take a look at the basics of ASCII and wide character strings, and learn how to investigate them with a few string utilities such as Floss. We'll use two programs to analyze. One will be a custom program that you can find in the Learning Malware Analysis Repository. The second will be the same Amade malware we started with in episode 1. All of these artifacts and links to these artifacts can be found under the title MM04 Strings and Floss at the CyberYeti.com. This video will provide you with a behind the scenes in which we'll look at and review the source code of the binary we're going to analyze, cover the basics of strings and how they're defined in a C program, and then finally talk about compiling the program and watching the program execute, doing just a little bit of runtime analysis. Before we get started, please take a moment and hit that like and subscribe button. Comments are open as well, so let me know what you think of this video and in this entire series in general. To begin, we have this simple program, and it's going to be built off of some you know, similar code that I've used in other sample programs uh, that you can find in the GitHub repository. Now, there are a number of strings here that we're going to analyze. So just starting simply from top to bottom, we have one uh, char array, which is a way to define our string that's called mutex name. And you can see that the value of this string is going to be defined between the double quotes. Now, I'm using hexadecimal notation here, the backslash x, to define individual byte values. So the string is not slash xc3 slash xff and so forth. It actually, the slash xc3, represents the byte value c3. Now, inside of main, I have three more strings that are defined. The first one is string one. I'm not using any sort of uh, fancy naming here, as you can see. And this one is a pointer to a wchar underscore t, which is a wide character string. Now, if you're unfamiliar with these types, these are relatively specific to Microsoft. And you'll find on MSDN, the Microsoft Developer Network, typically documentation that helps you to understand what the different data types mean. So here you can see just a quick view at the reference for the wchar, wchar underscore t type, which if you scroll down a little bit in the remarks section, Microsoft defines as an implementation defined wide character type. It represents a 16-bit wide character used to store Unicode encoded data as UTF-16 LE. So what this means is that these each character in this string is actually going to use two bytes. This is in contrast to the second string we have here, which I'm calling string two. Uh, this is a pointer, a char pointer. So the little asterisk here represents the pointer. Um, and this is just saying that this, this string two points to this string value. And this is, each character in this string is going to be a single byte. So this is an ASCII string. Now you'll notice that defining these strings is very identical here in the source code. The only thing that is different is with the wide character string, we have to add the uppercase L prefix. That tells the compiler that the string that follows is a wide character string. And if we didn't do that, likely we'd get an issue with the compiler telling us that these two types aren't compatible. That is, that this wide character string pointer isn't pointing to an actual wide character string. Okay, uh, the final is string three. And very similar to the mutex name up above, it is a pointer to a string, a char pointer. Um, and each byte value is defined with the backslash x and then the hexadecimal value for that byte. So uh, as you can see with these, these are our obfuscated or encrypted strings. Now, the program further goes on to define a function I'm calling decrypt encrypt. And you'll notice that it is called or something important happens. And there's really only one thing that's important that happens in this program. Well, I guess there's two things. Um, one, in order to add a sense of realism, is I am calling open mutex before the program hits its main functionality. And the main functionality here, uh, again, not all that important, but this is just so it's clear as we're exploring these strings in the actual compiled binary and the different tools that we'll utilize in the live stream, uh, those strings are just simply printed off. And so um, what will happen then is with decrypt encrypt, if we look at that function, it's defined down here, it's going to take three arguments, pointer to the string, the size, uh, I'm sorry, the key. So this will be a single byte XOR key, and then the size of the string or the length of the string. 
And then inside of this function, it's just going to iterate essentially over each byte of that string and XOR it with the key. So one of the properties with XOR when used in this form of, of encryption is that if you take your input data and XOR it with a key, you get the ciphertext. If you take that and XOR it with the same key, you'll get the original plain text. So what's actually happening here then and why I called it decrypt encrypt is because if we pass the encrypted or the ciphertext using the same XOR key, after this function runs, the decrypt encrypt, we'll get the decrypted value. It's going to use the same region of memory. So mutex name, this global variable, these bytes will be altered after that function runs. That way, this function call to open mutex using that string can use the decrypted value. Now, open mutex will try to open a handle to a mutual exclusion object. And you can go back to MSDN here and read a little bit more about that if you are unfamiliar. Um, but essentially, we're going to pass the name of the mutex object that we're going to try to open. Now, if the mutex exists, then that means that an instance of this program is already running because likely this is gonna be a unique value and it's using that in order to control synchronization or exclusivity. And that's, that's what I'm going for with the sample program. So if it's already running and it goes to open the mutex name, then it's going to, it's going to be able to obtain a handle to it. And that means that something else, another instance is already there. If we go to open the mutex and the mutex is not there, then that means no other instance is running. So we can then check for essentially the negation of that handle because open mutex is going to return a handle to that mutual exclusion object and enter into this conditional where we create the mutex. That way other programs that run will be able to see that it's already been created. They'll get a handle to it and then call decrypt encrypt again. And then it's actually going to now take that original encrypted string and essentially re-encrypt it. So that way during runtime, if anyone's doing any sort of analysis, runtime analysis, and trying to investigate that encrypted string, um, there's only a small window here where it's decrypted. After that, printfs, and then just the different format specifiers in order to print those string values. And of course, a call to decrypt encrypt for our string three. Now, you may be wondering, does this encrypt decrypt work, work with wide character strings? Nope, it works with ASCII strings. So that's very astute if you're observing that or wondering that. Um, very trivial, though, to make modifications in order to uh, adopt it to use wide character strings. But little things like that can certainly make a difference. Okay, now what's the goal with doing this with the strings, um, these, these encrypted strings? And this starts to show you not only, of course, we're seeing the importance of the strings, right? In order to open the mutex or create the mutex, we do need a string. We need a string that is in plain text, you know, deobfuscated, decrypted, and able to utilize. Um, and so it shows you not only the importance of those strings, but then also uh, the ease at which they can be obfuscated and encrypted. And what will happen then is you'll see this in the live stream that when we produce this binary and try to recover the string data, we'll be able to see these strings qu quite clearly, at least in most cases, right? We'll use tools that'll help us extract both the wide character and the ASCII character strings because there are some kind of limitations and quirks in our strings utilities, um, but it's not gonna recover these because it's not gonna be able to understand or recognize them, the, the tools that is, um, as printable ASCII or wide character strings. So even something as simple as this, a single byte XOR can actually be quite effective at just preventing that additional barrier or layer of obfuscation. Can we easily reverse this? Yes, we can, right? We're looking at the program, we see how simple it is. Um, but sometimes the hiding of strings isn't about making it impossible. In fact, it's not, it's not impossible to recover these, right? The string has to be in its plain text version in order to be used with this API the malware authors are just trying to raise the bar, raise the difficulty enough where it might you know, mitigate or defeat some of our automated analysis and just slow our manual analysis down. For example, imagine if this program had hundreds of strings that we wanted to recover and each of them used a different single byte XOR. Again, not incredibly sophisticated or challenging, but time consuming nonetheless to craft a way to identify each string and recover that key. 
So uh, let's go ahead then. We'll compile this program. It's rather straightforward. We'll just use the, the Microsoft Visual Studio, the Community Edition, using the developer command prompt. We have CL and XOR encryption.c. That'll give us our executable with the same name. And now if we run this program, you'll see that we we obviously were not able to obtain a handle. So we entered into the main if statement and then use the create mutex. Uh, and we'll take a look at process. Uh, we'll use process hacker or uh, I'm sorry, system informer uh, to go ahead and investigate that here in the live stream as well. Uh, but we have the printed string values. Of course, printing a string with non ASCII characters, we get what appears to be kind of a nonsensical string value, which it is. Uh, and then we have the decrypted string as well. Now, if I open up one more command prompt, which I have open here, if we try to run the program again, you see it's going to fail because it was able to open that mutex, uh, indicating that another instance of the program is already running. So it did not enter that made that primary if statement and it just went ahead and terminated. Okay, last thing this program does, just a long sleep. And the reason that I have that long sleep in there is so that once I start this program and I start talking in the live stream, it won't terminate and I won't have to start it over multiple times because that tends to happen. So long sleep there, easy to modify, take that out if you'd like. You know how to compile the program because uh, it it's, should be quite straightforward as you just saw. So feel free to make modifications and just experiment a little bit with what the code is doing uh, to help with your own learning. That's it for this video. Hope you enjoyed. If you have comments or feedback, please leave them below. Comments are open. I look forward to seeing everybody in the live stream. Until then, keep exploring.